Well, uh, Guillermo, what can I say? You have given a fantastic presentation of the benefits of uh, a weight-centric approach. But I have to defend the other side. And these are my conflict of interest disclosures. Really nothing I'm going to, they are not paying me to give this talk. And of course, I'm, my biggest conflict is that I support glucose-centric approach. So Professor Humpierrez has supported the weight-centric approach. And it's really an honor to debate with you. Uh, a few years ago, I had the privilege of debating Dr. Ratner, who was then the chief scientific and medical officer at Endocrine Society on metformin versus weight loss uh, versus exercise for diabetes prevention. And for those of you in the audience who don't know, Professor Umpierrez is from Ecuador. He's from a city called Guayaquil, which I've gone there. But in Ecuador, if you go there in Bogota, you can see the center of the earth. There is a line over there. Just a little trivia point about him. Very humble person. But I'm going to support the glucocentric approach. And I will argue that I think this is the right choice for your patient. Let's take a patient from our clinic. I mean, what Professor Umpierrez has presented is all very ideal, but we live in the real world. So here you have this patient, 52 years old, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, A1C 8.4. He's on metformin, lisinopril, atorvastatin. He's been told lose weight, lose weight, but he's got a living to make. He's got a job to go to, BMI 30, blood pressure is okay, and he's, of course, centrally obese. So what would you advise this patient? Weight-centric or glucocentric? But before we decide, as uh, 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 Guerma has nicely pointed out, only about 10 to 15% of those who have diabetes, they are lean. They have other problems over there. By far and away, yes, the bulk are there. And of course, he said, how do we define obesity? It's actually a linear relationship. 30 25, there are people who are 22 and the lean fat Indian who's got, uh, how do you find him out over there? Do you do a CT scan, a DEXA, skin fold thickness? Well, we can do what it is. But let's say you just decided on a weight-centric approach because Professor Goyal has convinced you that, hey, it's really good. But let's look at intensive diet and lifestyle. The cost is variable. It could be low if you just do walking, but you're not going to get much benefit. And moderate to high, you need to go to a gym, you need to you know, get a trainer and all that. Adherence is highly variable. Two times a week, three times a week, you might miss it. It's raining, it's too cold. Recidivism rate is extremely high. 80 to 90% in most studies at two years. Efficacy is variable, unpredictable. You don't know who's going to lose the weight. And the benefits, of course, as he, uh, uh, the, uh, he showed is Depending on how much weight, you don't lose weight really, you may get some metabolic benefits. Short-term cardiovascular metabolic mortality benefits, as of today, really none. Short-term, short-term. Long-term also is uncertain. The best data is from the Daqing study in China. They've got 30 years of follow-up, but Daqing study was not randomized. It was, each clinic was, uh, you know, uh, said, you do this, you do this. And that's what it was. So, Let's look at the look ahead trial, which was the largest study looking only to see intensive lifestyle, lose weight and see what happens. 5,000 patients, intensive lifestyle, decreased calories, increased physical activity. I don't know how many of my patients will go on a 1200 calorie diet and run for, you know, 175 minutes away. Other group, yes, do your regular thing. They said 7%. That seems to be the magic number. What happened? The trial was stopped early by the NIH because they said, futile, there's no point continuing on. Follow up for 10 years almost. So what was the weight loss? They started at 100 kilos, came down to 92. And by the end of the study, they were 93. Pretty good, actually. Plus the control group, 96. So three kilos difference between them. Good. Glucohemoglobin A1C at the end, about the same, 7.3, 7.4. So not much change. And they said an intensive lifestyle focusing only on weight loss did not reduce CV events in overweight or obese adults over 10 years. But they went back and looked at it. They said, let's see if it affects mortality. Again, did not significantly affect mortality risk. This is the cumulative hazard for mortality. 20 years of follow-up. Look what's there. Hazard ratio 0.91, not significant. And you can see over there, 
Of course, you know, over 20 years, almost 38, uh, more than a third of the people have died, but you cannot find any difference between the two groups. Yes, they had less blood pressure medication, but ultimately nothing. And yeah, of course, we have the direct study from the UK, interpretation at 12 months, half of people achieve remission, pretty good. But let's look at the study. 298 subjects, BMI 35, A1C 7.7, they wanted 15 kilos. How did they do it? 850 calories a day. I don't know that many of my patients are going to do 850 calories. Three months and then they could go up to five months. And of course, they did all this uh, follow-up and everything. Let's look at the results. They started at 100 kilos. A regular group, 100 kilos. Intensive group, they came down to about 85. And credit to them, they stayed at 85. But there were some people who didn't do it. They go back after the first phase and said, yeah, we can't do this anymore. Other, even after that, when they went to the to, from six months, 12 months, ah, we can't do it anymore. 17% of people, but 83% of people did do it. <clears throat> they went back and looked at two years. Now what it is, at two years, it's not half the people. It's a third of the people who've come down. Granted, they get some glycemic legacy or whatever it is, weight legacy. Let's look at the weight, 100 kilos. These people have come down about 98 kilos. These people are about 90. So good def deficit over there. But again, some people are not, about 17% are not, they're not dropping out over there. Best study, Swedish obesity study. So let's look at it. They had 2,000 subjects. 20% got gastric banding, vertical banded gastroplasty, 12%. This is because the study was done in the, nine, in the 1980s and 90s. Control group, non-randomized. So they just said, hey, you guys, maybe that person was not fit for surgery. That's why he was put there. And it's a poor case anyway. It was matched prospective. As of December 2018, they had follow-up for 24 years. So, I mean, that's a pretty good amount. And they had a control group uh, 22 years. What did they find? They didn't give me weight over there. They gave BMI. These people, pretty obese, 40, 41 in Sweden came down to about 32, 33, went up a little bit to 35, control group stayed over there, BMI. But you can see huge spread over there. The brown are the people who got the surgery. Let's look at mortality. Now this is over for, you know, 30 years, which they are showing us over here. That is a general group, their reference group, no obesity. Their death rate is 5.2 per thousand. What about the guys who got bariatric surgery. It is reduced, but it is doubled the uh, original group. They are 10.7 per thousand at 30 years. And how much difference between the other people? Yeah, 13.2, a little heavy. But remember, this was not a randomized group. They were just chosen over there, but because maybe in my opinion, they, they were not fit for surgery or they were not motivated. I don't want surgery. Anyway, among patients, obese bariatric surgery, longer life expectancy, but still Double that in the other population. And this is a bad disease. I agree with you, obesity and diabetes. Were there problems? Of course, there are problems. Alcohol consumption, alcohol problems, all are increased after gastric bypass surgery and over there. Granted, this is in Sweden. How much? About a, a justice hazard ratio of about five, actually. That's okay. They lost the weight, but now, you know, the pro hopefully they're drinking red wine. They're falling more and hurting themselves. They get admitted to hospital. How much increased risk of serious fall-related injury? Hazard ratio, 1.21. So they're falling more. I don't know. They lost weight. They lost muscle mass. They became a little bit there. What about the cost? I looked it up in India. It's about 5 lakhs. People have to put the money up front. It's very uh, ideal, but not really practical. This is from the NIH web website. What are all the uh, things of weight loss? Bleeding, infection, leaking from the stomach, small intestines, they're stapled, diarrhea, blood clots, follow-up intervention, surgery, hospitalization, very common in five months. One third of patients will need that. Follow-up procedures are more frequent after bypass, which is the best surgery. Rarely, you can get death. You went to lose weight. Unfortunately, the person died. Of course, this is well known. Dumping syndrome, 
you know, low blood sugar, gallstones, well known. You get much more gallstones, malnutrition, vomiting, ulcers, bowel obstruction, hernia. This is what really caught me. In the look ahead study, they went back and looked at cognitive performance. Now, you would think if you lose your weight, yeah, you're going to uh, do it. But get what? this is what they said. Improvements in glycemic control, but not necessarily weight status during intensive lifestyle may be associated with better subsequent cognitive performance. These associations vary, of course, by adiposity and CVD history. So it was glucose control which improved cognition, not weight. And the first author on this, Owen Carmichael, guess what he said? This is to an online journal. The more you lowered your blood sugar, the better cognitive function was. Weight loss was a mixed bag. And they gave lots of reasons for want of time. I'm not able to go into that. So what if you decide for your patient glucocentric approach? And Professor Guelma nicely said, yes, you know, there are these two drugs, GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT2 inhibitors. But remember, they were introduced for glucose control. And of course, they do it independent of your diabetes. That is different. But they do lower your blood glucose. By the way, they also, through different mechanisms, lower body weight. But that's an added benefit. But your glucose control comes down. And diabetes, as of today, is defined by blood glucose. So let's see. Let's come back to our patients. 57 years old, dyslipidemia, hypertension. I would submit if you did a echo, he's got diastolic dysfunction, but he meets the inclusion criteria for the declared to me study with SGLT2 inhibitor. As you all know, 17,000 patients, but 10,000 patients did not have uh, established atherosclerotic disease. So like our patient in the clinic, and they were followed for four years, not 20 years, four years. Of course, you know, there were two primary endpoints, CV death hospitalization for heart failure, 17% relative risk reduction. And it was, P was significant for superiority. Of course, the MACE did not meet the endpoint over there. But this is in four years. But you get some burn. And MACE, of course, as I showed you, the P was not significant for superiority. But in people who had established cardiovascular disease, yes, it was superior post hoc analysis. Renal composite. You know, the EGFR fall more than 40% with uh, uh, EGFR less than 60 and all that. 24% relative risk reduction. Now, I, they, and there was no uh, p-value because they went by that uh, hierarchical testing and they could not test for it. And this was in an editorial in diabetes care. They said in type 2 diabetes and multiple risk factors, dapagliflozin reduce heart failure, adverse outcomes, regardless of your baseline. And it supports a, in a broad primary prevention population. Like most of the patients you see in the clinic, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, they meet the criteria. Is it cost effective? Yes. And the UK is very strict. But by UK nice standards, it was cost effective at UK willingness to pay thresholds. And it has got a great potential to have a meaningful impact in reducing the uh, uh, economic burden of diabetes. And of course, that is all trials. What about real world data? This is from Taiwan and they have a very good closed thing. Look at that, all cause mortality, Hazard ratio 0.51. Yes, there are not many people, 3,000 and 4,000 other group. They did all the propensity score matching. I, is this really true? I don't know. Those are the numbers. Of course, it, is a, it suffers from the fact that it is a database. 